All right, we are going to get going. Welcome everyone to the Nonprofit Bistro Live webinar series, uh, Building Consens Consensus Online Lessons Learned. Uh, my name is Scott Vaughn. Joining with me behind the scenes at uh, today's sessions are my colleagues Shannon Shatuzzi and Kelly McKean. We're with the Community Development Unit of Alberta Culture and Status of Women. And we have a, and also today, uh, we have a wonderful panel that's going to help us explore our topic. And I'll introduce our panel guests in, a, in just a few minutes. But before I do that, I just want to first of all say a, a heads up. Our intention is for the session to go until uh, 3.30 today. I mention this only because that many of you come to our training webinars that usually end at 3. So what is today's session all about? Uh, our panelists today are going to share their experiences, insights, resources, and lessons learned building consensus with organizations in the nonprofit sector and in other related initiatives. Uh, some of the areas that you'll hear about is, you know, what is consensus? What is it not? You know, what needs to be in place before you start? Uh, consensus online versus in person, some of the differences and similarities and strategies and tools for, for building consensus online. Uh, all, all this is part of our nonprofit uh, Bisto series and webinar series to ensure nonprofit organizations have the knowledge, skills, and tools to be successful. Just a note here is that the panel format, format that we're having today is for a good reason. One thing we found in this topic area is that there's not a lot of accessible type resources that really focused on building consensus with groups and organizations, and even less when it comes to building consensus online. We would love to have a training session on here's how do you build consensus step by step in person or online. But the good information to have a session like that is we're still in the development phases. The good news is that over the last couple of years, many people have been asso associated with nonprofit organizations and groups have been thrust onto that stage, whether they chose to be or not. And I think some of you out there uh, probably are familiar with that situation. Well, so HES today is an exploratory journey uh, of building consensus from the perspective of three people that have been thrust onto that stage, tasked with building consensus, both online and in person a number of times in their work, especially over the last couple of years. And we'll have an opportunity to learn from their experiences and insights that they share. But a couple of things we did want to, to uh, also mention, um, you can see the other governance related webinars that we offer. You can see the details of all the sessions uh, and the link to register them that we have uh, with the Community Development Unit. You can see the link, albertacdu.eventbrite.com. Um, that's, you know, again, Shannon has put that into the chat box. So if there's any, some of the other sessions that we offer, we please invite your friends, colleagues, and others in your community uh, to come out and check out our Eventbrite page. And if there's some other sessions like that, uh, that you'd like to um, take part in that uh, come from our unit, that would be we'd more than happy to have you join us. As you can see, a lot of this, there's one more session tomorrow, building a strong team, effective relationships. A lot of the sessions from that point on will be happening uh, in the spring. And you can see the dates that are for some of those. And again, this whole nonprofit bistro series of which this, this particular panel session is part of, um, we have a couple of those coming up. Uh, you'll notice that we have a panel session on exploring the dynamic board staff relationship on March 7th. And we'll have another building consensus online uh, lessons learned session uh, in the spring as well. We were going to record all of our nonprofit Bisto series webinars, so you'll, you'll be able to chance to go take a look at them on the YouTube channel uh, even after the sessions. So, so, so again, if you really again, you'll see the YouTube channel that's going to also be in the chat box there as well. Right now, I'd like to take a moment to recognize that we're on the traditional ancestral homeland of many diverse people of Alberta, the First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose ancestors have walked and stewarded this, this land since time immemorial. We recognize our role as settlers on this land and we're grateful to work, live and learn on this traditional territory. We are all lo we're located across all, all of Alberta and acknowledge the land of many peoples presently associated with treaties six, seven and eight. This includes the Métis settlements and the six regions of the Métis Nation of Alberta. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude. As I mentioned before, we were the Community Development Unit of Alberta Culture and Status of Women. Our unit provides support for nonprofit community organizations as well as public sector organizations in Alberta on a wide variety of topics. If you need more information about our services, again, please uh, visit our website, give us a call or send us an email. 
and you can see some of that information that's in the chat box and how to get a hold of us. Feel free to put your comments, observations, and questions in the chat box throughout the session, but please keep in mind that it's a public chat box intended for attaining your feedback, presenting information, and, and learning from the topic that we, we're, we have today. We also have a toolkit with some helpful resources. And, and again, you'll be able to see a lot of this, you'll even hear some of the panel members speaking to some of the resources, but that toolkit is also there for you um, as, again, as for something that you even have after the sessions with is over, so you can take a peek at some of the things that uh, are, are some of the things that are mentioned in this session, but also some other things that are just uh, good resources around building consensus. I want to mention that the information presented today and the uh, related materials are not intended to constitute legal or professional advice. Uh, we simply want to share with you information that we think will be helpful as you navigate your organizations through its operations. And on that note, for your own organization specific situations or questions, you may need to seek the advice from a professional in the area. And again, the views and, and opinions expressed in this webinar are, are those of the panelists and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the government of Alberta. So with all that being said, uh, so on behalf of the Community Development Unit, I am pleased to introduce our seventh nonprofit bistro session, Building Consensus Online Lessons Learned, the panel discussion. Building consensus is often a, a key task that facilitators, chairpersons, and leaders of meetings are expected to do in the nonprofit world. However, you know, sometimes it is difficult to achieve this goal in meetings, and even much harder to do, as many of you probably experienced over the past couple of years in online meetings. We'll explore building consensus online with our three panelists who have facilitated various projects that included building consensus with participants as a significant part of leading them. They'll share their experiences, insights, resources, and lessons learned uh, with us today. So uh, right now, I'm very excited to introduce our three panelists. Our first panelist, Amanda Henry. Hi, Amanda. Amanda is originally from rural Alberta but like many people her age, settled in Edmonton after moving into the city to get a post-secondary education. She's a lifelong community volunteer and has stitched together a career spanning government, politics, post-secondary, and nonprofits. Amanda is a lifetime member of the Oliver Community League in Edmonton and has served on boards for a variety of community and advocacy organizations. She has been chairing and facilitating meetings for over 14 years. And Amanda currently serves as the executive director of the Canadian Condominium Institute, Northern Alberta chapter, and as the secretary of the Alberta Condominium Management Education Consortium. So Amanda, great to have you with us. Also with us today is Jennifer Baer. Jennifer has spent two decades working and volunteering in and with the nonprofit sector at operational governance and systemic levels. She has designed and facilitated majority rules and consensus dialogues and decision making at organizational, local, provincial, and national levels with nonprofit, public, and private groups. Topics she's worked on range from organizational strategic planning to enhancing quality and inclusion, policing forces in Alberta, and firefighting forces across Canada. She's also involved with addressing climate change and species at risk in Alberta and to changing nonprofit funding systems. Jen believes we can tackle the wicked problems we face through transform public policy development and community service delivery informed by dialogue that includes all people, centers marginalized people and builds true allyship with indigenous peoples. Jen interests include social justice and environmental issues, background, backcountry hiking and paddling, fun and laughter and spending times with friends and family. So great, great to have you with us, Jen. And our third panelist, Karen Blewett. Karen Blewett is a community development officer with Alberta Culture and Status of Women, one of my colleagues. For the past 17 years, her role has been to provide facilitation training and coaching with community groups and nonprofit organizations in the area of board governance, strategic planning, organizational planning, leadership, collaboration, fund development, and other community development topics. Karen holds a Master of Science degree in Community Development and a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and a Diploma in Nonprofit Management. So in the spirit of volunteering, Ken, Karen also stays active on a number of boards, committees, and other community projects. Great to have you with us, Karen. So just before we get to some good conversation going with our panelists and have some good discussions on this building consensus, 
I just want to, um, a few reminders before we get going, that this is an introductory exploratory level discussion of building consensus. Uh, the, panel, the panelists are gonna share their insights, lived experiences and learnings. The, again, the views and the opinions and perspectives of the panel members are their own and are not intended to constitute legal or professional advice or represent the views of the government of Alberta. And there's gonna be Q&A time with our panelists nearer to the end of today, but certainly write your questions in the chat box as we go and we'll include them in that Q&A portion of our panel discussion that comes a little bit later. All right. So let's get rolling right into, and one of the first things we're gonna do, actually we're gonna hear from all of you out there before we start uh, moving into some discussions with our panelists. And this is what, um, we have a question for all of you first. When you think about building consensus with a group, whether online or in person, what thought images come to mind for you? This is all of our, for all of our listeners. We want you to, to answer that question. This is how we're gonna do it. We are gonna have a thing called a jam board that we are going to, I'm gonna put it up right now. And you're gonna provide, and again, for those of you that come to our training sessions, this is, not, this is nothing new, but for the, those of you that haven't been part of, the, part of these jam boards as much, here's a, a quick little explanation. To an, you're simply gonna answer that question. You can see the question at the top and there's four icons on the left. And you can see where it says sticky note. You click on it, it says sticky note. Um, and I'm just gonna put an example in there. It, takes time. Let's say if that's your one of the answers you were thinking. So then you click save, cancel, and then it goes right into that spot there. So it's as simple as that. And so we'd like everyone to, again, before we start quizzing our, our panelists and have some good conversation there, we'd like everybody to add their thoughts, populate this Jamboard that you see in front of you right now. So we can get, a, get everybody's thoughts around uh, when you think about building consensus with a group whether online in person, what thought and images come to mind for you? So I'll give everybody now a minute or two to provide their thoughts on the Jamboard. And for some reason, you can't get into the Jamboard, simply put your thought into the chat box and then Shannis and I will, and, and Kelly will make sure we, we, we place it over into the Jamboard. Sometimes the Jamboard gets full and it, things don't work quite so well from, from your end, but give it a try first and then um, add your thoughts there. I see some coming in now, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, I see some in the chat box too. You keep getting cut off. You're hearing all, all voices. Also into the Jamboard. Yeah, consensus means different things, different people. Um, some things that are images are coming to mind for people. Uh, being flexible to others' needs and ideas. Finding shared values. You know, because if you coming in that hearing all voices. Yeah, asking, is there anything about that you can't live with? I thought in there. Sometimes you do hear that that kind of wording comes in discuss, discussion aimed sessions. Lots of building a case showing key metrics to show a certain method has merit. Yeah. Important for all to be engaged, being extra clear on next steps, mutually agreed upon outcomes. Yeah, we're getting some uh, images and thoughts for that you, uh, the participants and the snapshot of participants that we have here today. Safe way for everyone to share. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, moving from various opinions to a common option. I'm just reading a few of those. I think our jam board is getting very full. That's a good thing. All right, keep them coming.
All right, I think we get a, definitely some thoughts to get us started on when you think about building consensus with a group, whether online in person, what are some of the thoughts and images that everybody has out there? So thank you everybody out there for your, your thoughts uh, to that question. I'm also going to, um, to uh, ask our panelists, just as our again, warming up a little bit, just a, a thought or image that each of you have um, you know, to that when you think about building consensus, whether online or in person, what are some thoughts and images? Uh, again, just uh, briefly that each of you, that thoughts have come to mind for each of you. So Amanda, start us off. What is a thought or two that, uh, that you have that you, comes to mind for you? Uh, thank you, Scott, and thanks for the opportunity to have such an interesting conversation about a topic that's clearly really popular today. Uh, the first thing that always comes to mind for me when I'm talking about consensus is actually the image of an iceberg. Um, and this can apply to many kinds of meetings, but I think even more in consensus than others is like what's happening in the minutes is just the tip of the iceberg. There are a whole bunch of other factors that go into having um, a decision making framework that's healthy and will help your organization achieve its outcomes. Something that somebody put that you read out that I really liked was that the uh, the process of taking a bunch of opinions and moving them towards uh, agreed upon outcomes is um, a lot of that work happens below the surface of the water. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Jen, what are some images and thoughts that that uh, that come for you when you're talking about uh, building consensus with a group? Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, you know, I always think about like a round table and dialogue. Uh, and so when I think about uh, people conversing together in really engaged ways, I imagine people leaning forward. I imagine a lot of passion in their voice and in their word choice, um, probably a lot of emotion um, around the conversation. And so I really imagine this like round, you know, it gets me <laughs> It gets me thinking about like sitting around a table with my friends, like really engaged, leaning in, really passionate. I guess I start thinking about that's the image that comes to mind for me around consensus is that we all care and we all are really engaged and active um, in this conversation. And because we all care about the topic and care about each other, uh, we take care with the conversation. All right. Yeah, there's really engaged, but leaning forward, really uh want to be there. This is, this is important. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Karen, what do you have? What's your thoughts and images around this whole building consensus, what we're here for today? Hi, everyone. And yeah, there's some really great ideas showing up in the Jamboard, so I can relate to a lot of that. One thing that really stands out for me in consensus building is the idea of it being a process or journey. So I think, you know, we have to kind of really remind ourselves that it takes time, patience, and a coordinated effort. So just like any journey or, you know, voyage that we go on, there is lots of different paths and routes that we can take. So just being mindful of that and, and making sure everybody's aligned and working together to, to come together to an agreement. Right, it's, it's a journey, the whole journey idea that it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some work, and it's not gonna all happen at once and yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing your images. And again, thank you everybody again for, for your images on the Jamboard. I think that'll be helpful for us throughout the whole session today. I'm sure we'll reflect back on that. Um, but what I'd like to do now is, and I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen and maybe we'll chat a little bit more with our panelists and see them in a little bigger view here. Um, I'd like to have each of you just, just share a few, maybe even some of your key experiences that you've had building consensus, you know, online or even in person that um, that you can share with our listeners today. What are some ones that, uh, yeah, that you, that would be, you know, be good, get, get a chance to get to know each of you a little more by sharing what some of those experiences are. So Jan, start us off. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess there's a couple of things uh, or a couple of examples. One that um, I've been involved in as a, both as a facilitator and as a board member, both in person and online is strategic planning. 
uh, which is a process of looking at a variety of uh, influences from the environment on your organization, on your membership, on your mission, and trying to uh, settle on a path forward and key kind of markers on that path. So I've facilitated and participated in those conversations both online and in person. Um, another recent example was working with uh, a provincial nonprofit organization, uh, looking at uh, a transition of their executive leadership and uh, coming together to discuss, you know, what do we see as major um, obstacles and major challenges in the near future and what kind of skills and talents are we looking to hire in our next executive leadership. And, and so, you know, really trying to find consensus on vision for the future and vision for the type and style of leadership for the organization. Uh, I was in that, I participated in that as a facilitator. And then um, one other example is uh, on behalf of the government of Alberta, facilitating a dialogue between multiple industry stakeholders, environmental group stakeholders, uh, and uh, indigenous communities and Albertans around um, basically land use planning and how can we achieve uh, strong economic outcomes at the same time as we increase, we achieve stronger environmental and wildlife outcomes. And so um, I facilitated that actually started in person and then COVID happened near the beginning and we moved online and finished that work online. All right. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing those experiences. And I, and again, it, it, it gives a sense, a taste of what some of those, I'm sure some of you even listening here today are here, some of those are familiar, some of them are not, but, uh, but let's add to our wealth of experiences. Karen, what are some of the experiences that, uh, that you've had to build consensus with some groups and organizations where that, where that, where that was the aim? Yeah, so similar to what Jen said, you know, working a lot with nonprofit organizations and so you know, we do get, you know, working in, in our, our department, we do get a lot of requests for strategic planning, similar to what Jen said, as well as just other conversations that boards need to have. So sometimes it's about the board roles and responsibilities and getting into their structure and how it impacts the organization or some of the implications of COVID and helping nonprofits, you know, sort of prioritize and then having to pivot online and doing some of these things. So sometimes the conversations have ranged from strategic planning all the way down to, you know, kind of narrow focused on a particular priority or area within that nonprofit. So lots of different conversations with, with nonprofits. Also doing a little bit on evaluation. So kind of evaluating our organizational capacity and evaluating programs and projects and things like that within nonprofits. And then from a stakeholder perspective, also um, ideas like working with a whole community. I did an online, I've done a few, and we could probably, Jen and I could probably share some epic fails as well in terms of when technology doesn't work and, and things like that. So there's some examples of doing actually a community visioning exercise with a, a rural community or, you know, a particular hot item that's going on in a, in a, in a region and having some dialogue around that and trying to come together with some agreement around those things. And then also even just down to the local level of working with groups with memberships and, and kind of trying to engage members on, on different topics and things like that. So it's really broad ranging and also ranging from teleconference. Yes, that still happens. That just happened to me recently, all the way to high tech, you know, online tools and then hybrids of, of half online and half in person and, and all that kind of thing. So there's many different tools and formats that the consensus building can, can have, kind of look like. So definitely experience a variety of different things that way. Well, thanks for sharing those, Karen, those, you know, some of the areas where you've, you've been in those, some of those spaces. I think that that's very helpful. And yes, yeah, so even some of those areas, things that we learn when things don't go as well, too. And I'm looking forward to maybe dig into that a little bit later, too, perhaps there. Amanda, let's, uh, let's add to our experiences that we have with this incredible panel here today. Sure. So like Jen and Karen, I have done a bit of strategic planning, though mostly in person for me. Uh, a lot of the, con and that, that often involves consensus building just because it's so key to the shared direction that an organization is taking. I also do, a, I do a lot of work on um, political advocacy and, and policy change. And 
uh, have facilitated quite a few consensus building exercises around shared uh, policy priorities. And it was a real adjustment to move a lot of those conversations to online. Uh, everything from sort of getting ready to submit policy resolutions to huge assembly style gatherings at the committee level to uh, cross uh, organizational partnerships. So, you know, recently in the work that I do for condominiums, uh, the condominium management profession has just become licensed. And we did uh, a shared submission to the regulator responsible for that licensing across condominium industrial associations. And that had to be consensus um, strategically for the, the aims that we were trying to communicate and was done entirely virtually. So that kind of thing. Uh, I also do a lot of operational consensus building, which I think will probably be pretty familiar to folks. We might not think of it this way, but um, it's very common in the organizations that I work in for planning things like volunteer appreciation and event planning to proceed by consensus because you want everybody to want to come and to enjoy and to be bought into ex having that experience be fun. Uh, and we most of the hiring work that I do proceeds through uh, consensus based committees. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for sharing again, adding a very, a very broad uh, work that you've been involved with and um, building consensus with a number of groups and organizations. Thank you for sharing, sharing that. That was fabulous. Um, I do have a question on this we, as part of the experiences that uh, you've shared. And there's a, so many of the different experiences you have. And I'm sure even our people, our participants out there could add to the, all their experiences that we could have a whole bundle of an incredible number of experiences where we had to build consensus in our in our work in our as not in the not-for-profit world but i do have a question for you and i might maybe send this question to jen's way uh why should we make efforts to build consensus where applicable in our nonprofit organizations why is you know all those examples that you gave and others could give why is it so important what are the benefits of doing that mm -hmm. yeah i do think there's a number of of benefits that make uh, a consensus approach the, you know, the appropriate choice for decision making for nonprofit organizations. One um, that I think both Amanda and Karen mentioned is it's buy in. Um, when people are involved in a decision, when they feel like their voice is heard and they've contributed to whatever the final product is, whether it's a choice, whether it's a design of an event, whether it's a solution to a problem, uh, they're, they're more likely to support that going forward um, and to speak positively about it. And, and so I think that buy-in is a real benefit. I also think there's a level of commitment that is a consequence and a benefit of a consensus approach. When people feel like they are part of a team or an organization that cares about them, that, that respects them, that values their input, um, that demonstrates that they really have something con to contribute, I think you're more committed to that. Like you're more likely to stick around. You're more likely to um, put in more hours volunteering or do that little bit of extra effort on, on something you're responsible for. And so I think people's level of commitment to a team and an organization increases, which I mean, consequent byproduct is uh, less recruitment necessary because people stick around a little bit longer. Um, a third key benefit for me is more creative solutions, like more creative answers. I think that the kinds of things you want to build consensus around, um, for Amanda, you know, she mentioned um, an, an, a volunteer appreciation event that really appreciates all volunteers and the, and the full diversity and variety of people, how they've contributed, who they are to the organization. Uh, Karen mentioned strategic planning. You know, how do we move forward two years into COVID? Um, there's co armed conflict ha happening in Europe now. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, how, do you, how do you move forward as a nonprofit? How do you plan strategically for the future to really come up with creative, meaningful, um, and I think probably wisest, so not the right, I don't think there's one right answer, but the wisest uh, solutions, maybe more nuanced um, solutions and ideas, it really takes multiple people with different perspectives, having explored an issue together and discovered a solution together. And, and so I think, it, I think it just strengthens an organization's ability to act well and meaningfully. Certainly commitment, creative solutions, hearing all voices. Yeah, good messages there, why we go down that path so well. Thank you, Jen. Uh, not gonna go spend too much time here. Um, I'm gonna ask the question here is from your perspective and experience, 
when is consensus maybe the the when is not the appropriate method to seek for group dis decision making? You know, we saw the value of our experiences we've been all part of, but is there times is consensus solve all the problems, or is there times when when it is probably the the not the most appropriate? What you know, what might be some of those times? Scott, I can jump in on this. If that's sure. okay. Okay. Uh, the first thing I would say is when you are up against a very, very tight and immovable deadline, uh, consensus cannot be pressure cooked. <laughs> uh, the other place I would say that it's difficult is when there are distinct sides and when there is a risk of there being a right or wrong answer. So, you know, for example, consensus would be a pretty inappropriate tool to use as part of a dis disciplinary proceeding where there are two parties and, and one or the other or both feel like they've been wronged. Um, asking them to participate in a consensus framework is not going to work. You you want to you want to look at something that's maybe adjacent, like a restorative process or mediation, but it's a different sort of facilitation tool, and you might need an expert. Whereas consensus, you can do on your own most of the time. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Some of the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, what what are some what are some things you know if, when you're going down, you're building your concept of of consensus. Um, we talked about some of your experiences. Just to, I'm just going to ask Jen, what is your what is your own working definition or concept of consensus? When you think of somebody says building consensus, we just heard from Amanda what it is not, when it's not. But what is when you know? Yeah, this is probably the right time to use this. When is the when do you know that it's probably going to be a good good thing to do? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I think my I think my understanding and my kind of idea of what consensus is and the benefits of it has probably changed a little bit over time. Um, I will say I used to think of, of consensus kind of as a binary. You're either all on board or you're not. Uh, you either all agree or you don't. And I don't think that's what consent, after a lot of years working in this, I guess, I don't think that's what no. consensus is anymore. I think it's a spectrum of support. Um, you know, I may, there's some people who love it. There's some people who don't love it, but they won't get in the way. There's some people who don't know because they need more information or they need more reflection time or whatever. And so I think consensus is appropriate when, when um, something is complicated or complex, there is no one right answer. Um, there are many paths forward and it's trying to choose the one that maybe has the least obstacles or uh, has, the, has the best risk benefit ratio or something like that when um, on issues where um, any one perspective is not the whole perspective and you need the variety of perspectives and the variety of kind of visions of things to, to, um, to really understand the issue and come up with a solution, I think is when it's appropriate. I also think it's appropriate when there is a need for significant buy-in. Like when you need everyone to get behind a decision and feel some ownership of a decision so that you can move forward together in a more coordinated, supported team fashion, I think consensus is really appropriate in those spaces as well. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, question for you, Karen. What are some steps that you do or things you try to put in place, even discussions you might even have um, with group participants or, or how you might set things up before even entering into or leading consensus aim discussions? What are some things that uh, you think about or you do just to share with our, with our listeners today? What might be some of those things? Thanks, Scott. I think what I'm going to do actually, is I'm gonna share my screen and share this little diagram uh, with everybody. And let me know if everybody can see it. Can you see it? The steps in building consensus. Yep, we so, can see it real good. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we're, I'm not going to get into the details of each of these because you know we're we're here to just kind of cover the, the overview. But for the the first two steps in this in this process of consensus building, to me, are really critical to really dive into with very intentional thought. So the first one is the readiness of of the group, you know, to participate. You know, are all the leaders on, on the same page? Is everybody committed and willing to, to move forward with consensus building? You know, we, we talked a little bit before about it. It can be time consuming. So if you have a, a traditional agenda where you're whipping through things or even a consent agenda where you actually, you know, compile all the reports together and approve, thing, approve things in one, in one quick go, 
consensus building or, or trying to come together in that collaborative space really isn't going to be effective because you don't have the time it, necessary that it takes to kind of unpack it. So really being ready for, for it in terms of making sure everybody's on the same page and willing to go down that route. And I've worked with not, lots of nonprofits too, where even there might be a few, let's say in the case of a board member that, that are keen and wanting to you know, move forward. And then when you get in the room, you realize that maybe not everybody was, was even ready to have that conversation at that level. So it's really important to, to have that readiness. And then the second piece is the idea of you know, having really well-defined expectations and being able to manage those expectations. And so you know, a clear purpose, obviously overall, what the whole conversation is gonna be about but then also what everybody in the room is committed to. So not just in the discussion, but afterwards, because I think part of consensus building and the agreement piece is, is to figure out, is to come together on the implementation, like the, so what, now what, how do we move forward with this? And so I think these two stages are the number one and number two on the screen. And I'll talk, I'll show this, this slide again later, but I think those two are really, really uh, critical pieces. And they, they then kind of help inform number three there, which is then actually designing the process that you're going to use. And in an online context, you know, that's being mindful of, you know, what kind of questions do you ask? How, how comfortable is everybody with technology? You know, what, how much time do we have to get through this? And, and all of those kinds of things. So I think those are, I think the preparation side of it is really critical to success for building consensus. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, uh, you know, that visual even too, Karen. I think, it's, again, for everybody, this is in the toolkit as well. You'll be able to have access and take a look at this as part of the toolkit resource that we have for this session. Um, and again, that's a great uh, way of giving us some ideas and even to, I think we're all looking for those tangible things that how do we do this? So, so thank you for that. Um, question for you, Amanda. Again, sort of tying into the same area before you even start, uh, when you're asked to build consensus, consensus with participants online or in person or in topic areas, you know, that was going to be challenging. What are some things you do before you even begin? Well, you know, Karen had, had a pretty good model, some of the things that she draws upon. What are some things that you do, Amanda, just to share? Because I think this is a really important area that we're, uh, I think, again, anybody that is going down this path would be, this would be really helpful information. I Thanks, Scott. Karen's tool is great, and we'll kind of touch on some of what I'm going to go over at a high level, and I'm, some of this is in some of the toolkits, and I'm happy to discuss it a little bit more if we have time in the Q&A, but um, just quickly, I think folks are probably hearing like a lot of, oh, that's going to take some time. That sounds like more work, and I want to say, yeah, uh, consensus isn't necessarily going to be a time saver for your organization. What it does is allow us for stronger decision making. Uh, so you're using your time more effectively and it can, you know, help strengthen your organization's commitment to some of its strategic objectives. Like this is a practical way to, to create space for diversity uh, in your decision-making structures, but that doesn't mean it's going to be quick. So in terms of the pregame of consensus, uh, it's really important and it's more difficult than a Roberts rules sort of traditional for and against style thing, largely to do with familiarity. Most people who have board experience have been in a room where they get a motion dropped on them and they have to decide fairly quickly if they didn't read the agenda in advance, whether they vote yes, no, or don't vote at all. Consensus really needs everybody to come to the room prepared and thinking because we're going to need their best thinking and you need them to actively participate. Otherwise, you're not going to find a ton of room for consensus. Now, it's possible to get consensus in a room where people don't all care about the issue or don't care about the issue to the same degree, but you're still going to need somebody to volunteer that information so that you know that they're participating. So before I could begin, you need consensus on consensus. And I'm kind of kidding, but not really. Uh, if you've got one person on the body that is insistent that the only way to make decisions in this room is Robert's Rules of Order, and that is the only decision that they are going to make, um, they are uh, have already told you that they're going to do what's called blocking the consensus, so you're not going to get anywhere. Um, you also need people to have some time to prepare mentally for this decision making framework because it's going to be new. So you need to have that shared understanding set out in advance, possibly even at a separate meeting like this is a good kind of conversation to have in a annual strategic plan if that's the kind of thing your organization does. Um, the other pieces you need to assess the tool that you're going to use and like 
how it either constrains or supports consensus. So in person, it supports consensus because you're physically in the room together and you can see nonverbal language. Um, and we all have pretty good, like ad adults who do this kind of work have instincts around when to move a conversation and when not to. Um, but uh, in-person consensus can only occur with the tools and the people that are in the room. So if somebody's not able to make the meeting or there's a travel barrier or your organizational membership is provincial, like you, that's the constraint. And the other thing is like most of the rooms we meet in, I'm sure some of you have access to awesome rooms, but a lot of the nonprofits I meet in meet in halls with plastic folding tables and chairs and, you know, a, a fold up easel that you can put white paper on if you're lucky. Uh, whiteboards, breakout rooms, polling software, like that stuff isn't necessarily easily accessible. Online, you have to do a bunch of work and thinking about what you're gonna do to deal with the nonverbal cue and how getting into the habit of checking in, but you also have all these cool tools that you can use. So, you know, Zoom has this pretty powerful tool called breakout rooms where you can send people into small groups and call them back. And it's way easier to do it in Zoom than on person because you don't have to physically go chase people. You just hit a button and boom, they're back in the main room, whether you like it or not. You can also use Zoom for um, polling, like you can set polls, you kind of have to do that in advance, otherwise it's annoying, but it's there. Scott showed you a tool called Jamboard, which is a great way to simulate a consensus building tool that I know Jen and Karen and I all use around getting people to put sticky notes up and then physically moving them around to achieve a consensus when you're trying to come up with theme areas and stuff. So I assess those kinds of tools and sort of come up with an inventory of things that are great. Um, and you need to share that with participants in advance. Like, so let people know what it's gonna look like so that they know how they're gonna participate. And the last thing I will say, cause I don't wanna take too much time on this answer and I already have, is um, common vocabulary. Lots of different consent, like, so when you're voting in Robert's rules style thing, it's yes, no, or abstain. Um, and everybody has a pretty good handle on what those means. There's different ways of achieving consensus and Jen touched on this around agreement. A common one is um, if you agree, if you agree with reservation, if you're gonna stand aside, which means you, you're not invested enough in this question to, well, stand aside, you actually need to define, but like where you're not gonna block the consensus, but you're not gonna support it either, and then block. Um, there are other kinds of terminologies, but that, that one shows up in some of the tools. Uh, so you'll see that, and you just, you need to make sure that people have heard those words before and know how to use them in the meeting. Right, so certainly hearing again from Amanda and, and, and as well, um, you know, we heard from Karen, there is, you need to do some, some good prep work, think ahead how you're going to do it, some of the tools you're going to use, sharing some of those tools, um, making sure that you're kind of thinking about all the parts of it of how, before you even start. So yeah, yeah, thank you for, for that. I do have one question for, and I'm going to send it over Jen's way, this question. Sometimes there is, wow, we're going to build consensus, we're going to solve all the problems that we have to solve out there. Um, this is going to be that, you know, it's good. Yeah, we've heard this is going to be a wonderful tool. We need to do it this way. But how do you manage expectations? You know, what are some of the things that some people see this is going to be the, this is going to be the magic tool that's going to, we're going to sort through and get to the end of this problem that we've had for a long, long time or, or whatever the case might be. How do you, what are some things you do that you might manage expectations towards that mm -hmm. end? Yeah, that's a really good question because I don't think if anyone's looking for like a silver bullet, oh, we'll do consensus, that'll solve all of our problems. No, it will not. <laughs> like consensus is a tool that is appropriate at some in some types of situations for some decision making, but it's not always the most appropriate tool. Amanda, I think earlier actually pointed out a couple of places where consensus is like not appropriate at all. So um, I think part of expectation management is actually part of what Amanda and Karen talked about is making sure that everyone understands like, what are we doing here? What does consensus mean for us? What is this gonna look like for us um, you know, from, from, a from a process perspective or even from an experience perspective? Uh, what are some of the tools we're going to use? Um, how do people need to show up for this? And so I think part of managing expectations is ensuring that, that people understand that this is not 
going to be going to provide us the magic solution to all the challenges we're having about everything, not just this decision, but disagreements between those of us on the board and some of us not liking each other. And if we can agree here, it'll be easier to agree there. And all it, it's not all of those things, right? It is a decision making. It is one approach to decision making. And so I think talking again, talking about that, we are working on consensus on this issue. Here's how we need to be ready to participate. Here's the tools we need. Here's how we're going to approach it. Um, and, and laying all of that out, I guess, from the beginning for me is a good way to manage expectations. The second thing I would say really quickly is making sure, um, asking people what they expect from consensus. So was there consensus on using consensus? I'm gonna assume yes, because now we're managing expectations about consensus. Um, but what does that mean for everybody? Like, what are they expecting from this? Um, are they expecting a binary, we're all on board or, or we're not? Or are they expecting something else? Um, Amanda talked about a spectrum and I've mentioned it too. I used a six point spectrum for one of the groups I worked with consensus on. And if you were a four or above, that was considered consensus. And if there were any fives or sixes, then we had non-consensus. Um, and so managing expectations by describing what does consensus look like? What does it mean for us in this situation? Are we all in agreement on that? Do we all understand that? I think also helps manage consensus and helps us realize that it's more shades of gray. It's more complex than, you know, black and white, yes or yes or no, good or bad kind of, kind of attitude, which I think a lot of us take about consensus. Um, to that point, there is a comment in the chat about ability to achieve true consensus. And so I think a part of managing expectations actually might be that as well. What is true consensus? What does that mean for people? Um, I'm not sure I know what true consensus is. And so if that's someone's expectation, um, I think manage exploring what that means and then managing that managing that through a shared understanding of what it's going to mean for the group um, is super critical. So certainly exploring some even key assumptions on words that we use that uh, as part of the consensus building process. What do we mean by this? Are we together on this even before starting a, a consensus building aim so you might be going for? Yeah. Yeah. And it's tough to manage expectations if you don't know what expectations are. Right. So I think that yeah. that's an important part of it is going, ar going around and saying, what are your expectations of a consensus process on this, on this decision, on this point that we're going to be exploring? Yeah. Yeah, we come up with some, just came back to that, circled back to that point a few times, how important that is to make sure we're understanding those assumptions, those key base points, key terminology, key understandings, and all of those points. Yeah, thank you for, mm -hmm. for yeah, for sharing that again. I, I mean, we've, we've been on this, this area a little bit already, but I was going to add this final question in this, in this, this whole part when we're talking about building consensus and this before you even start part. What overall are just some critical factors, would you say, that need to be in place, you know, for our listeners, for people, if you're, if they're walking down some of those paths um, over the next, uh, you know, short is a short period or maybe a longer period. What are some things that uh, uh, critical factors that need to be in place in your team before you work towards consensus? What might be a few of those points, maybe even some of the ones that we haven't said yet, but even if you uh, um, re-mention those again as well, what might be some of those, those points? And I'll, again, Jan, Amanda, Karen, anybody want to chime in on this one? Scott, I'm actually just going to take us quickly off track and then come back to what I promised for something sure. just in the chat. Um, doc, uh, Dr. Haynes has posted some information, some you know notes about Indigenous lenses on this kind of work. Yep. And uh, I wanted to touch on that and acknowledge how important Indigenous perspectives, cross-cultural perspectives, intersectional perspectives, depending on the kind of organization that you're in, are. Well, intersectional is always important, but um, this... We had a good conversation about that when we were planning for this panel. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we um, recognize that that's a really, really important aspect of consensus and, and decision-making culture in general in organizations. But this panel, we didn't feel was like the, res the right place to respectfully dive deep on those issues. We don't have the right people on the panel to share indigenous perspectives and experiences. And the panels was framed around um, more sort of practical applications to 
trying to make this model work online or in organizations that are trying it for the first time. So uh, our advice to CDU and you know Scott and his team were very receptive to this is to find a place to unpack those conversations respectfully uh, where there's more room to really, really dive deep on those issues and to bring the, the right voices to the table. So sorry for cutting in there, Scott. Oh, no, no, that was, that was really good. Thank you for even addressing the question in the chat box there too. That was- Yeah, uh, mostly I'll catch them at the end, but that one I just thought was important now since yeah. we were talking about managing expectations. So manage a little bit of expectations around this panel. We're not gonna be able to talk about in, incorporating indigenous practice into your organization, but that's like a really excellent thing to look for in terms of trying to find the expertise and, and work through reconciliation and diverse decision-making in that way. Yeah, critical success other. factors. Yeah, that's one of them. All right. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, Amanda yeah. just demonstrated one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, other, what we've kind of touched on this, but like um, a shared understanding of the framework, a shared understanding of the criteria for action. So, you know, we've touched on this before, but we all know that if we're sitting at a table with Robert's rules, 50% plus one yes equals go forward and a consensus framework, you just need to know what it is. Like, you know, Jen's framework is everybody above a four, we go, everybody who is either stand aside, agree or agree. Um, the one thing with consensus though, is you, uh, you do need like, no one is actively or aggressively opposed to this point of view or this form of action. That's a place in consensus, but just understanding how you're actually gonna make that work in your organization, what language you're gonna use. Um, some existing things in the organization, you need healthy lines of communication uh, already. Like you're, I, this isn't a great icebreaker <laughs> uh, for an organization. Uh, you need enough time and you need a plan for facilitating. Uh, consensus is a little bit, isn't always the same skill set as chairing a meeting. So you need to have a think of, like, if your culture is to sort of gavel through decisions and Karen mentioned this, like that consent agenda, whipping through stuff. We have 7.4 minutes to discuss this on the agenda. You're gonna need to have a think about what that actually looks like if you wanna use consensus for a decision. Yeah, I would add a couple of things to that. Every time Amanda says Robert's rules, I kind of like, ugh. Uh, <laughs> um, a couple of other things you need similar to, um, Amanda said, uh, healthy lines of communication, which I think um, requires strong relationships. Um, doesn't mean you all have to be, you know, friends forever or BFFs or whatever, but strong, respectful, professional relationships, which I, I think kind of go hand in hand with good communication already, I think it's also needed. If you don't know each other and you don't have some respectful relationship with each other, I think, at least in my experience, um, especially online, consensus is really hard or much more challenging. Um, so I think relationships are, are a critical success factor or maybe at least commitment to building respectful relationships through the process um, if, they, if they aren't there um, beforehand. The other thing um, I would add is I call them like guiding principles or group norms that you'll see at, a, at the beginning of a lot of facilitated sessions. How are we gonna work together? Um, what, what are we expecting from ourselves and each other in terms of how we show up, um, how we speak to each other and how we um, actively participate in this process. I think those are really, are really important to have that, yeah, group norm, code, of, like, I don't want to say code of conduct because it's not a code of conduct, but yeah, these, I, these agreed upon expectations for each other. How we're going to play together in the sandbox and, yeah. you know, and work together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very helpful too. The importance that is. And thanks for for highlighting that, Jen. Um, one question I'm going to have on we've we've touched on it a bit, so I'm just going to ask one question in this area. But building consensus online versus in person, just going down that path a little bit. Um, what's the same online and in person? And what makes and and what from in person do we need to focus on? recreating online remotely what are some of you know comparing the two which is more challenging uh, but what are again what are some of those things we have to focus on recreating online remotely when we compare to when we're thinking about building consensus in person i can start with with one or two things that come to mind uh first for me and then i'll, I'll turn it over to karen and amanda um but I think one of the things, um, so Amanda had, had spoken earlier about like, um, 
you know, online and in person, there's benefits and constraints to both. You have a physical room in person, so you can all be in the same space. You can see verbals online. You know, it's very easy to turn cameras off and it's harder to see nonverbals because you can only see me from my collarbone up. Like you can't see if I'm tapping my pen or, or whatever. Um, I think that um, we don't, we think about the tools, we think about the room, we think about like the tangible we think about the really tangible things, but I don't know that we often think about the intangible or the things that happen around the process in the room that we, I think we're missing online. One of those for me is, is the coffee conversations. So one of the benefits of doing consensus in person together is that you, you literally are in a space together. And so you can talk during break while you're getting your coffee, or you can you can eavesdrop on the other two talking during break while they get their coffee. Uh, you are standing in line together to get lunch. You walk in together or you walk out together or you help put the tables out together or clean the tables up together. And those unplanned, informal interactions between people, I think are beneficial to building consensus. And I don't think we've recreated that online. I don't even know that we've all really thought a lot about how to recreate that online. There's some thinking on it, but, but that one is a tough one, I think, to recreate online, but something we really should be thinking about. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's the one I'll start with, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Amanda and Karen. Yeah, just a, a Connie from one of our participants uh, chimed in here too, saying it's hard if people don't have, if they have limited time, it's more difficult to make time space for some personal sharing and some again making some of the challenges you have going online. I think maybe time to some of that, that ability to chat uh, together in person we do more naturally. Um, I think we do more naturally in person but actually the time and space is a really interesting comment in the chat because and I've talked about this with a lot of people. Two years ago when I had meetings, it took me 20 minutes to drive there. I showed up 20 minutes early because I needed to park and get a coffee and use the bathroom and settle down. And I wanted to chat with my friend. And I usually stayed 20 minutes later and <laughs> chatted with people and whatever, and then packed up and then got in my car and then drove home. And now literally because we're online and we don't have to move between meetings, meetings, if they're not back to back, they're overlapping. Like we don't take 15 minutes breaks between meetings as easily anymore. And so literally, we don't have the time or space for those conversations. Um, because we're online and it's so easy to jump on at the last minute or to do multiple things or whatever, you know, check your email during your board meeting, you're literally even in the, in the time you have set aside for the conversation, you're not spending the time on the conversation or at least there's a real risk of that. And I think that's, that's another thing that makes online, so online in, in some ways more challenging than in person. You're getting some agreement there too as well from more participants. It's we get more tired than if it was even having face to face, even that addition as well. Anybody there's else? There's a bunch of science to sorry, there's a bunch of science to back that up. Mm -hmm. like why okay. Zoom fatigue is is a thing that's more so if you're feeling that, like I just want to very, very, very much validate that that has to do with how your brain is wired and how it interacts with these little four squares instead of being in a room with people. All right. So there's okay, even some literature research that, that backs it all up as well. So, so in case we're all feeling tired out there with these meetings, there's there's some good rationale, reasoning behind it all. Thanks, Amanda, for, for that. I'm not sure if anybody wants to chime well, in I, on I guess that I'll, one. I guess I'll say one more thing on that then too, since we're bringing up time and it being more tiring online is, in my experience, things are taking longer online. So I've been estimating if you think something will take an hour in person, it'll probably take an hour and a half online. The thing is Zoom fatigue. We can't spend much more than two hours online before we're just drained and we need a break. Um, and, and we're Zooming back to back to back to back. And so I think that, and, and maybe it's not just online, maybe it's online two years into literally our lives being online and remote. So maybe it's right now online, things take longer. And so one thing you should, Amanda mentioned that a critical success factor is that you need enough time to do it online. You need enough time to do it. You can't, you can't rush it. And you, to be safe, you should probably expect it'll take more time than you think. Okay. Thank you, Jen. We're going to, um, uh, we're having a break coming up in a probably about two thirty-three somewhere in that area. 
And uh, we're after the break, we're going to move into, uh, and we've already shared, shared some strategies and tools, Karen getting started us down that path, and we're going to share a few more after the break as well. But before we do, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda, who is going to, to because we bleed into that strategies tools area, just a little exercise she did with us and uh, some of the results of it and some of the meanings around it. So Amanda, over to you just to, to share us this little uh, doodle exercise that we were all involved doing, all, all yours. Sure, so just to kind of change gears when we get up to stretch and things, I, uh, both in person and online, there's an exercise that I like to do to just sort of loosen people up and get them thinking uh, practically about what, so we've talked a bit about, you know, having open lines of communication and having a shared understanding, but like, what does that actually look like when the rubber hits the road? Um, so the exercise, uh, this group's uh, too big and we don't have enough time to do it, but at the beginning of a, a, a process where we're going to have some consensus, um, it's fun on the online, you can sort of inject the fun factor a bit, which is where I like this. I basically, I, you give all the participants a set of, in, of instructions, um, asking them to draw. And adults don't really like doing this exercise. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can see my part, my participants all nodding enthusiastically, but it it sort of requires you to embrace your inner kid and do something a little creative and not what you expected. Um, so, so you have to doodle something and then you have to share with the group what you did. And what I tell people, I have tell them to draw a handful of shapes and then use the shapes to draw uh, an animal. Everyone got the same instructions and this is what we got. So the good news huh. is that everything on, this, everything on this page is an animal. Um, some of them are a little bit more abstract than others, but <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, we had, like Eva, we achieved a shared understanding of what we were trying to do, which is draw an animal. But even with the same instructions, you got incredibly diverse outcomes. So, um, you know, on the, the blue one um, on my left is a bird. If you look carefully, you can see the wings and you'll see its feet, like the Roadrunner style feet are a whirlpool style spiral. If you look at the poodle in the center, you can see the spiral coming off of the, the right-hand corner, but it looks like a corkscrew or a spring. They both got told to draw a spiral. Um, so it's a fun little way to kind of loosen up and, and you get to, you have to show off your drawing. A um, couple of things that I like to just point to is like consensus is often about good enough and what you can live with. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be right. So everybody here understood the assignment. Everybody here got to an animal. And then you would use a consensus-based decision-making structure to sort of figure out which animal meets the needs of your organization with the resources it has at this moment in the organization's history. The other thing I like to kind of flesh out about this is um, you really do have to be more deliberate in the language you use than you think. Because um, everybody brings their own context, their own lived experiences, their own assumptions about how they communicate to one another. And even something as simple as draw a spiral, now use it to draw an animal, results in all kinds of outcomes. Now consensus is cool because it captures this. You would, like a consensus-based model gives you the opportunity to sort of explore, like, oh, Ollie, do we need a puppy? Do we need a cat? Um, and that brainstorming is part of the process uh, where a yes or no kind of a model wouldn't get there. but it's just, it's, it's a fun way to sort of, to, to me, to like visually illustrate what you want versus what you get. And then you kind of go back and you can use, and I also find in, in, in person, it, something that's funny on this. Um, it works great in person and online. Online tools make it possible to share it uh, the way you would do this in a room. Um, the way I've done it online is you just get people to take a picture of their drawing, like e either take a picture of their drawing and share a screen or literally just physically hold it up like this. Um, and you get to have a little quick chit chat. Uh, online, I get just this wild variety of stuff. So you can see three different things here, three different approaches. So the Roadrunner, they drew the shapes on the page and then like connected them to make an animal. The cat drew the shapes on a page and then like reorganized. In person, people almost always draw a sheep because the last shape that I tell them to draw is a cloud. Oh, very interesting. You know, very interesting. the other. Yeah. I just want to jump in here because, um, because yes, drawing as an adult who doesn't consider themselves an artist mm -hmm. is like really hard. But I think even that is a good lesson in consensus is that this is not, it sounds simple, but it's not easy. Like it's not easy 
for all of us. Um, the other thing I was thinking about as Amanda was talking about this and talking about, you know, we all received the same instructions, we all got to very different places is consensus allows you to, to go all the way back and say, okay, well, we have to draw a spiral. But there's flexibility even in drawing a spiral. I assume there's not. I draw it my way, but other people drew it different ways. And so even there, there's opportunities to explore perspectives and to explore nuances and to reach consensus even on those building blocks of whatever the final product is. I really like, except I'm an awful drawer and had a lot of anxiety about it. I really like the activity. I think there's a lot in there. Yeah. Thanks. Tony was mentioning too, there, you know, she's experienced, I'm sure others have as well, that, you know, building consensus over the past years has been very difficult. And, you know, even the important, you heard it before we even start, making sure how are we seeing things together, that emphasis that we, some of the assumptions, some of the things that we need to, to chat about before we even start. I think that's uh, some of the pieces that we've learned here before the break. I think that's been very helpful. And again, Amanda, thank you for, for even that, uh, really kind of pulls together a lot of the thoughts and ideas that, uh, you know, we've had, we've been talking about so far. So let's, it's, it's 2.35 right now. We're definitely not finished. We're going to 3.30, but we need to take a five minute break. So uh, let's come back at, at 2.40 and we're gonna start talking about strategies and tools. So everybody do what you need to do and we'll be back here again at 2.40. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Hopefully we have back, everybody back here. You had a chance to, um, do what you need to do before before we come back for the second part of our building consensus session today, and we are going down the path. That we've already touched on a little bit already. Karen's uh, moving us down the path of uh, some tools and strategies uh, around building consensus. So even to lead off in this session, I'm going to turn it uh, back over to Karen. What are some things, some more things that uh, can be very very helpful? Uh, around strategies and tools that you've used to build consensus or support consensus building online. What are some of those things, Karen, that again, first, first of all, welcome back everybody, but uh, I'm now turning over to you, Karen, to, to, to lead us down this path of strategies and tools for building uh, cons consensus online, all yours. Thanks, Scott. So yeah, I thought I would just share the, this five step to building consensus uh, sheet here again. And what I'm going to do is kind of dive a little bit into number three, which is designing the process. So we, you know, we talked a fair bit about the preparation and kind of some of the things that need to happen before, and as well as, you know, some of the, the challenges even with, with online engagement and, and fatigue and, and some of those things. So this, this next piece will be sort of, from my perspective, I'll just share some you know, kind of tips related to the actual design of the process. So I won't get into the dialogue and decision making and the implementation, which are also really important, but just to kind of hone in on, on number three there. So number three is, you know, there's a number of things that fits within the design of the process. And the first one is to really figure out what kind of engagement tool you actually need or would work best in the situation that, that you're in as it relates to trying to build consensus. So what are we trying to achieve from this consensus building? I think it was Amanda talked before about everyone being on the same page of how we actually define it, things like that. And so, you know, one of the things that I find really important when I work with your nonprofits is meeting them where they're at. So uh, an example of one group I worked with, they, not that long ago, actually just a few months ago, they were having some, some challenges with the organization moving forward and some board roles and functions and how the organization was structured. And so what I've learned from having the preparation and the readiness conversation was they were not really into online anything. So the most they had done was, was a Zoom meeting. They had never experienced breakout rooms or, or any other kind of online engagement tools or things like that. So one of the things that we, we did beforehand was we talked about uh, having some preparation work for the, for the board to kind of think through some of the, their own perspectives of, of how they, you know, what, what they feel about the organization and, and where they're coming, at, coming from personally. And this was really important in this particular instance because there was some kind of heated and, and maybe some diverse perspectives on where the organization should go. So what we did is we did a Google Doc, which was a document, which was still pretty straightforward for the group to be able to go online and fill it out. 
but it really gave them that that sense of of feeling like they were contributing and um, kind of where everybody was at, like the readiness with the group. What was really interesting was is you did see the very diverse perspective on you know in this preparation. And so then when we got to or when I got to the designing of it, I, I was really intentional with having a reflective conversation with them to kind of before we go guns a blazing and try to come up with the an agreement is to really unpack and respect all of the perspectives and, and kind of share with each other, you know, you know, how we got to where we're at and, and the different kind of opinions and those kinds of things. So so that's that was an example of a of of a situation where I, I involve some pre-planning pre in the actual design of the process and with a group that wasn't really comfortable with, you know, trying a, a new online tool in, in, you know, playing around with online engagement type of tools. So that was an example of that. And so then, uh, so for number two there, I kind of kind of touched on it. It's how do we actually create that interactive environment? So a lot of our conversations are around the brainstorming piece. How do we how do we provide, you know, our ideas and how do we share them and organize them? And so a couple of different platforms, and I'm not sure if, if Amanda and, and Jen are going to get into some that they've used, but these are like there's tons. There's probably hundreds of different tools out there, but some that are just sort of ranging from simple to more, you know, more complex are, you know, obviously PowerPoint and whiteboards and a couple more that are very, you know, using, I guess, more in-depth online platforms are things like Miro and Miro, and we just experienced Jamboard. Jamboard's pretty, pretty good in terms of it's pretty straightforward. You know, so there's different ways groups can do that. And then also getting feedback. So, you know, polls and SurveyMonkey and Slido and a Mentimeter, which is an online, you know, an online tool. You can do wordles and, and word clouds and, and things like that to kind of in the moment share people's perspectives. And then of course, I think it was Amanda brought up with the breakout rooms. So really having the focused conversation around that of what, what does that look like in the breakout rooms? So one of the things or one of like one of the things that I think is really important is the design of those those facilitated questions in terms of what are we asking the group and what are we trying to get out of that conversation and how are we going to get to that consensus? So it's really important to have very intentional questions. And I think, I know for me, it takes me a long time to get to those questions because you want them to be very meaningful and, and get the, you know, results that you're looking for. And so, and then number three there is, yeah. is integrating facilitative techniques that are inclusive and, and trying, in, in the case of building consensus is trying to get to some level of agreement. I thought it was pretty cool that Amanda and Jen both shared a couple of different ideas in terms of these coming to an agreement. So I found this on the right hand side, and you can see where the source of it there. It's actually from drawing drawingchange.com, I think is, is the actual uh, website link. And this information is in the, in the toolkit as well. And this is a, a graphic facilitation out of BC, I believe. But but anyway, I thought this was kind of an interesting one of looking at it from a sort of a eight point scale and how the level of support that you give in terms of agreement for you know for for your perspective on on the topic at hand and then i like that they gave an online tip too of doing like a five point scale you know we're we're in in, a, in the old days or not the old days but pre-covid you know where people would do the the fist to the fingers kind of exercise where if you if you really like the idea you know you have more fingers you have up or you know there's different ways you can do nonverbal um engagement to kind of canvas the room or, or to see where everybody's at so I just thought I would share a couple, a couple of um, steps or processes and then an example of, of this agreement. I personally haven't tried this, this exact agreement type, but I, th I thought it was kind of an interesting one that I hadn't seen before that could be a, adapted online. Well, yeah, thank you, Karen, for pulling this together. I think we're all looking for tools and strategies and things that we can use. And you pulled the even, the even identified a number of, uh, you know, processes that you can use and other things that tools that you can use um, as, as part of the information you're providing in this whole this five-step design you know process that you've been showing to all of us so that's been very helpful even the ideas that agreement is comes in different levels it's not yay or nay it, you know there's different you know looking at from building and consensus is even more on of a continuum more more 
and it's looking at the different uh, gradients of agreement, if you will, even use, utilizing the wording in your diagram. That's this there. So, yeah, thank you. I think that's very helpful. Again, everybody, this is in your toolkit as well, what uh, Karen is sharing. So, uh, yeah, thank you for all of that. Uh, Jen and or Amanda, what are some steps, tools, or techniques or resources that uh, you draw upon when you're building consensus? Just even again, what are some of the, and we have a lot of experience, so I'm sure you've had to use many different resources, but what are some of the ones highlighting some of the ones that are you found very helpful? Amanda, go ahead. So I actually find the Google suite very helpful. Um, so if you have a Gmail account, uh, you kind of, you get free access to a limited amount of storage in a Google drive and you can collaborate on, on all kinds of things. Uh, one, so I, I, um, especially in smaller groups where people are sort of tech, somebody savvy and comfortable, actually having, um, the Google document that you're working on open so that people can see it and put in notes and things is a pretty powerful consensus tool, especially when you're still discussing the proposal and sort of trying to refine what the options look like. We talked about on Jamboard, um, for folks who don't know, that's actually in Google as well. So if you go into Google Drive and click new, you have to kind of search for it, but Jamboard's an option. So um, that's really great. Um, some, you don't need to get too far into the tools though. Um, you can just, uh, um, like the, the process is more important if I can say that. And then uh, there are, you can also kind of repurpose tools. So, uh, you know, I don't know if folks are use virtual backgrounds too much, but Zoom and Google Meets, Google Meets being free, Zoom only being free for 40 minutes or two people, um, lets you put up virtual backgrounds that I have found that you can do sort of facilitated prompts with that fairly effectively. So. Uh, Karen's gradient of agreement thing, you could actually just throw up on the screen behind you uh, as the chair of the meeting, and then you just sort of duck out of the way if people want to read it. Um, I, and a fun one that I have seen used in uh, a sort of millennial group, if I can use that, I am one, so I could use it, um, is you doing a gradient of agreement style thing and mapping it to the reaction icons in Zoom. So if somebody, as you're going along, people can non-verbally check in with how they're feeling about the discussion. So, you know, if, I, uh, if I'm really jamming and really like it and nodding vigorously, but not sure if you can see it because my photo is really tiny or people might be following along on their phone, I can just hit the ta-da button. And so a little thing pops and then whoever's talking and sharing knows that I like really strongly agree with what they're doing right now. Um, they use the wow one for a question. So like, I have a question. And I thought that was funny. So that pops up and then they go, oh, you know, <laughs> as soon as I'm done talking, I'll get to Amanda. So um, you can be a little creative and you don't, don't get, but don't like, don't freak out about the tools. Um, they're just there to help keep a conversation organized in a way that you might not normally. Right. And keep it interesting and fun to some as well. So that, yeah, some of those little things we can utilize some of those tools that we have. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Jen, do you want to chime in on some tools, techniques, uh, things, strategies that you might use that uh, share with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, <clears throat> I'm with Amanda. I think process more than tools. Tools should be kind of the last thing you're looking at. But um, last, well, no, I was going to say last March, but two Marches ago, March 2020, when I moved online from in-person conversations with this multi-stakeholder uh, group looking at uh, economic and environmental outcomes collaboratively. Um, I did use an online whiteboard I found was really helpful for brainstorming, for getting all the ideas on the table, for, um, for everybody to see what everyone was contributing, but also for people to be able to share in a nonverbal way. So if they weren't comfortable speaking or we were running out of time, they could still write their ideas down and get it on the board. Um, I used Zoom polls a lot because we did use a gradient of agreement. And so I had, I used Zoom polls a lot to pulse check uh, whether we were close to consensus or far from consensus. And um, to Amanda's point about uh, Google Docs, I shared screen on Word Docs a lot and both took notes, but then also refined statements and ideas as we were working. And so for people to see it coming together 
uh, in real time. And because I was doing it online on share screen, I could literally, as soon as the meeting was done, hit send um, was really, I think, um, powerful for the group. The one thing I would add that for me is kind of, I don't know that it's a tool, but it's a resource. And it's something I keep in mind whenever I'm working on consensus is if you Google like grown zone or something like that, a whole bunch of images will pop up on your search engine. But the idea being that um, you start with the identification of an issue, you expect divergent thinking to follow that. So you expect uh, myriad ideas, you expect the ideas to get further from each other and more varied and more of them, you enter this, uh, what some people call the grown zone, others refer to as emergent thinking, you start to play around with it, it is a super uncomfortable space and you feel like and you are further from the issue than you were when you started. And it's when you've started to when you've done some of that emergent work and some of that like, oh, this feels really messy and really hard and feels like we're further from a solution than we were when we started, et cetera, you start to move into convergent thinking. And so you start to narrow down your options and refine your options and uh, get more nuanced and detailed in your options before you agree on, like you reach a point where you agree on a path forward. And I guess I use that because or I, I share that as a resource or share that as a tool because I think it's really important to remember that sometimes things get messier and harder before they get simpler. Like you have to wade through some stuff in order to get through it, in order to get to consensus on a thing. And so I just think it's an important kind of uh, perspective to keep in mind, uh, especially if the conversations start getting more difficult, but also in your planning for the conversation, how you support that divergent thinking, getting everything on the table is very different than how you support convergent thinking and trying to now come together um, into, into an area of agreement. There's a question I'm going to, I see in the chat box right now that's really related to connected to what we're, we're chatting about right now. And I think from Toby, if the gradient of agreement were to be utilized or any other tools like it, uh, at what point do you consider consensus to have been successfully achieved? And that's, you know, tough, tough question, I would think. But what is just from the, what you what were your first thoughts there, Jen or anybody else? Honestly, yeah. mine is that you agree on it before you start the work. And so I, I'm also, again, thinking of the group that we started in person, we met in person November, December, January, February, and then suddenly found ourselves online in March, 2020. One of the first things we did in the first meetings was agreed on um, a vision for the work we were doing, outcomes we wanted to achieve. We also agreed on the gradient of agreement and what constituted consensus and what did not and why. And so the gradient I happened to use in that one was a six point gradient. And what we agreed was that the first four points um, meant consensus. And if there was anyone who was at a five or a six, it meant the, I, the item was, a not, was not consensus. We had not achieved consensus on it. So you consider a consensus successfully achieved when you meet the definition you've set as a group, as a team, when you start the process. Yeah, very helpful, Jen. I think, again, going parking back to what you said, importance of having those agreed upon uh, assumptions, agreements ahead of time before you're walking in and, and actually doing so. Well, yeah, great, great question from Toby, but again, great, you know, a good response as far as we, that's the work you do ahead of time to make sure you've got that very, very clear in the front end. Oh, I, oh, sorry. sorry, Karen. No, Karen, you go ahead. I was just going to say, just um, I know on a couple of the resources on the on the toolkit, there are some examples, actually, I thought they were really good examples of questions that you can ask then when you like in that, like those, those processy type of questions that you would ask to get to that. So you, you may agree, like I think what Jen said is great, you know, what you, you agree to it beforehand, but what are the kind of questions we ask ourselves to kind of know if we're there, like in the post. So there's a couple of resources in that toolkit, but one of them I think is four questions to ask yourself in the when you're building consensus or something like that. I can't remember the other one, but I can, you know, we can yeah. in the toolkit there, there's some good sample questions on, on the process side. Right. Thanks for pointing that out, Karen. Again, in your toolkit, some really good resources that, that helps towards that path, towards that end. And again, Kelly just put that that resource, the toolkit into the chat box right now. This is actually, we kind of segued really, really well into this uh, uh, into this section that we want to be that we we're doing right now, we're moving right into uh, the Q and A portion of uh, our session right now. And I, and this is the part where we do want to. We've had some questions along the way here, but now we're I guess more formally 
Um, going to take the questions our panelists uh, try to have our panelists uh, take them on and see if uh, some of the thoughts even to add to our learnings today as part of that whole process of the Q&A. And uh, so the, yeah, so here's how we're going to do it. We do want to any of you I'm gonna, some of the questions that were even asked earlier, uh, I'm going to bring those forward. But also if anybody has a question, uh, as we formally asking for Q&A from all of you out there, this is the time just simply you can put the, the question into the chat box and we'll, we'll make sure we pass on that question uh, in the time that we have. Or if you want to even uh, verbally ask your question, just put a one in the chat box and we'll know that uh, we'll unmic you and, and have you uh, ask the question directly uh, verbally to our to our panelists. So that's how we're going to do it. So there's probably we're going here to probably about 315 ish somewhere in that area with some Q&A parts and uh, and then again, and, and add to our learnings from from the whole part around uh, some some of the questions. And we do have a few questions that came earlier. We'll keep looking for them. Um, I guess there's a, see a comment from Dr. Sean Haynes. It says consensus builds peace, health, ethics, civics, and strength. Maybe kind of using that little uh, good statement reminder about what we're. Thank you for thank you, Dr. Sean, for that uh, thought that kind of leads us into uh, this whole Q and A part right now. Question earlier that came from Sue Welke, is it a good idea to ask people to do some pre-work before the meeting to, to facilitate consensus building? Again, I, 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 th yes. I think I said, yes, yes, a big yes, yes. <laughs> Anyone elaborate some more? I know we've been touched on this a few times, but yeah, is it good to you know, get people to do some work ahead of time before they come in? What's your thoughts? More than yes. Amanda, go, Amanda, go ahead. Because I was like you, I was just like, yes, <laughs> sounding yes. <laughs> so you you will need as part. So without the default offered in standard parliamentary procedures like Robert's rules, Jen, um, you, you are going to need people to do some pre-work around like what consensus needs to look like in this group. So to Toby's question, like that's got to be done in advance. Um, even more so than in agendas where you're making a yes or no decision, people need to read the materials. <laughs> uh, they need to have a thought about um, whether or not they need more information, uh, if they need to check some assumptions. Um, you really need to be prepared, I think, is, the, is every individual person needs to be. You, you, you are not just prepared to show up, shut off your camera and listen in and like vote when somebody, when you hear all in favor, you need to be prepared to be cameras on, talking and, and grappling seriously with the, the question being asked. Mm -hmm. Which I would hope you're doing for all meetings, but just like a group can sort of get by with a majority of people paying attention in a majority rule situation. You can't get by like that with consensus. A question related to that one though is, any ways that you might have to encourage people to prepare well before meetings? That's one thing we need to do it. How do you, what are some, do you have, is there any strategies or techniques or something you do to motivate them to do that homework? And I know that's a difficult one, but what are some of your thoughts from, from all of you around that, that whole idea? I, have a, I think a question or a comment that I would make to that is, is getting to the why, why consensus building. So, you know, Dr. Sean even had, you know, some really good words in there as to the value, the value proposition of it, like, why are we doing this? And, and, and why is it important for you to contribute and actually spend that time, you know, to, to prepare beforehand. So I think if, if that why piece is, is addressed and everybody can, you know, see the value in it and how it's going to help the organization or help your cause or, or whatever it is, I think that's, that's really one critical uh, thing to success. I just I'm just working with a group right now. It's a, a volunteer group with no staff, and I we're doing a little bit on purpose. And I I hone, I do have like what do we do and who do we serve and that. But then I have a question around the why because I've been kind of fixated on the why more lately. And I was I'm so excited for this. There's there's 60 members, and I already have I think some, like 30 some response. Like so I have pages of you know, the value and what, what the organization means to them and, and very heartfelt, you know, things around their values, as well as why the organization is important and needed. And so I think I wasn't expecting that because sometimes I'll work with groups where they don't respond at all. And other times, and this group is like hyper engaged. And so 
I don't know what the president did or or the chair did in that situation, but he should have motivated them to to uh, you know respond. So I think that that's an example of where it can be really effective and then help shape the conversation that we're going to have tomorrow night. <laughs> I think just building really quickly on Karen's, I was I was going to say the same thing as the why and to make it to try and connect it to something personal for them. So if you have a relationship with them and you know something about them, you can personalize the why for them as well and help them help them um, see and, and really um, well see and understand their why. Why would this pre-work be important? Why is it important that I show up prepared? Um, the other thing I was going to say is consensus. I do think um, um, enhances buy-in and commitment of people to both the decision that you're making or the problem you're solving, but also to the organization. And so maybe the first time, first time or times you try to do this, there isn't a lot of pre-work done and it's a struggle and you're spending time in the meeting, like catching people up. And I get that. And that can be frustrating. And if you can, if the consensus exercise is still positive and people feel, um, people see their contribution in the decision. They see how the contributions of everyone are contributing to the decision and shaping the decision. You might find that it breeds in, uh, increased pre-work in future conversations. So it might be an investment in the future, even if it's a struggle right now. Some mechanical things. Um, one that I like, so some organizations have to have agendas, uh, but when you're going into a concession based thing, an agenda can be kind of dense and people sort of like zone out. Um, just send the two or three questions that you need that we're going to be discussing, like, or uh, what questions you're going to need to answer. I also am a big fan of micro deadlines. So if you, you know, a strategic planning workshop, a really common one, if you're bringing in an, uh, an external facilitator that I've used a lot is the facilitator needs to get to know us. She has sent us this list of questions. I need your answers to them by, you know, 10 days out from the meeting or 10 hours out from the meeting, whatever your organization's like. Um, you can uh, turn on comments. This is a really passive aggressive one, so forgive me. But in a group where I was having some challenges, just repairing the relationship that people had with the work and with like feeling that their opinion was valued, put up the agenda, put up a comment and added everybody's email addresses in the comment with just a like, please, um, please write yes in the replies once, once you've seen this document. Um, and hopefully you're not in that kind of a position, but just there, there are kind of little technical tools you can use to give people that jolt, be like, oh, right, I actually, because people get busy, they forget. Um, or they're so used to not even getting their hand up in time when the vote is called that they, they don't feel like their preparation is valued. So they're investing their time in other things. Yeah, very helpful tips. Very those little things sometimes can mean a lot for the everybody to feel engaged and feel their message being heard. Thank you, Amanda, on that. Just one another, from another side of this uh, pre-work ahead of time for our participants, uh, Doug mentioned the, the just asking the question does pre-work generate entrenched positions or again or, or does it depend on the type of pre-work any thoughts around around that thought that question i would say it depends on the type of pre-work yeah so certainly right? like pre-work can be get really clear on your position get gather all the facts for us i would not recommend this as pre-work by the way but it could be or pre-work could be working to understand diverse perspectives, uh, reaching out and having a conversation with someone you think thinks differently about this before the meeting to understand their perspective. Um, I think, I think pre-work does not have to entrench positions if you're thoughtful about the pre-work. Okay. I think, I think that's a great question actually, because I think it, 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 you're right, it can depend. Like um, this one that I'm working with right now, all of the people were sending me their thought, like it's sort of a more traditional format. So they were all sending their feedback individually. They did it individually and sent it to me. Whereas when I've done Google Docs or some online platforms, it's great because it's asynchronous so you can do it on your own time. But then you also see what other people uh, have written and that they may or may not be inclined to share if your opinion is different and you're, you're kind of, depend like there's so many variables. So I think it does depend on the type of, of you know, prep work that you're doing and what you're trying to achieve out of it. So it, it, I think it can, but it can also be a really good way to engage as well. Right. 
Thank you, Karen. Another question is, uh, again, really down to looking at when you're actually doing those online sessions and Wanda has a, a question, what do you do when you can't see everyone? It, it is a drawback not to have physical uh, cues. What's your thoughts around, uh, what, how do you, if, if you had to deal with things like that, what are some, some any Amanda, Karen or Jennifer, what's some thoughts around that when you can't see everyone, how, what are some things you can do or is there some ways that you can get, a, you can get around that? Good. I would, so it's a really, really good question and easily sort of hitting right on the nail of the, the, the most challenging constraint for online as far as I'm concerned, um, just my opinion. But the, I'm also like very, very extroverted and have done a lot of facilitation work. So it's, it's really demoralizing for me to be trying to facilitate a room and seeing all the cameras off. Um, not with this one, because I've shut off the participants list so I can just see the other finalists' lovely faces. But um, it's tough because you want to be inclusive of people who have their cameras off for good reasons or they're phoning in or um, or you're using a teleconference system rather than a video conference system. Um, the internet's not great everywhere in this fine province. Zoom is not always the most productive tool and nothing sucks more than sitting through a meeting where you spend 20 minutes listening to people say you're cutting out to one another. Um, I have, it depends on the culture of the group a bit. Uh, a lot of the groups that I facilitate, like work in and, and facilitate, find the chat to be a great way to, to deal with that. It creates kind of a multitasking issue. So it's gonna take longer and you're gonna need to have breaks and you're gonna need to accept uncomfortable pauses while people are reading. Um, and you might want somebody designated as the person who like reads out loud to make sure that everybody can see the chat. But the chat's an option. The little emoticon thing I talked about, and you can verbally ask for that if you're facilitating. Like you can say, hey, you know, I know lots of people got cameras off. Uh, I just want to do a quick check-in. Like, how are you feeling about whether there should be pineapple on pizza? Um, I feel like this about that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pineapple is a pizza food. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, somebody else might go, uh, oh, I don't have it handily. Like, May not think that as well, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what coffee cup means in this context. You need to figure that out in advance. Um, I think if I can be a little touchy feeling, then I'll turn it off or stop talking on this one is, um, it's okay to make space for being frustrated about having to adapt to having like those tools. Like it, it's, it's okay to not have the answers and for there to be sort of awkward pauses and for, you know, sometimes, sometimes you got to take breaks. Sometimes you got to say like, you know what, I, I, uh, I'm having a hard time with, with where this conversation is going. Let's take a five minute break. Um, and you just kind of need to get into the habit around understanding, like in person, we all know that feeling, right? You're getting fidgety because you've been sitting in a chair for ages and you kind of go to the bathroom. So you ask for a break. Um, online, that's there too, but it can just be like, I'm tired of staring at a wall of black screens with people's names on them. I want to stand up and like, Go pet my cat. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amanda. That's a, yeah, good thought for, for, for that question. Um, here's a question from Linda. Can you ever achieve consensus without meeting, whether online or in person by using other processes or is it really only able to be, to be achieved in a meeting? That's an interesting, interesting question. Any, an interesting. any thoughts around that one? That's a super interesting question. Honestly, my gut response is yes, it is possible. The design of the process would have to be really well thought out and there would have to be, uh, there'd have to be high levels of commitment to activity from people. Um, because the earlier question about like, how do you get people to do prep work? My question would be, how do you get people to do the work if there's no meeting? because all the work would be happening, I guess, asynchronously and, and remote. So, so my short answer is yes, I do think it is possible with a committed group who will actively participate when there's no meeting they need to attend. And well, yeah, well thought out. All right, thanks, Jen. Here's a question. Uh, have you found a difference when introducing, like when you're doing consensus around change when compared with something new? Is there, is there a difference there or would it would be, would, have you, I'm not sure if any of you have had, ex, 
you know, experiences around maybe building consensus around uh, something new or building consensus around something that's related to change? Is there, and if so, is there, have you found a difference when you're, when you are building consensus in those, in those two areas? It's a really interesting question. I've never really thought about change versus something new before. So maybe, and some of the distinctions that I use are like, what's the, the impact or goal of the decision? So, um, you know, we're going to order pizza. What topics do we want? Like, I think many of us actually have experience with informal consensus on that actual question. Um, and that's a, a very different process than we are going to start a new program. We're providing comments on a new licensing framework to an external stakeholder. It's a real one I've done. We, or, you know, a change. There can be sort of positive changes, negative changes, mixed changes. So strategic planning is often a, a process of change around building on past successes and lessons learned. But, you know, consensus is a tool that we use for some really tough conversations. Um, you know, I've been, I haven't had to facilitate any of these, but I've participated in conversations uh, around cuts uh, and, you know, whether or not we are going to offer that program anymore. Um, those are often consensus based and the, all that whole spectrum of consensus. Yes, there's differences. There's differences around the emphasis you put on group norms versus process. Um, there's a difference around the number of options you can entertain, the kinds of questions you ask. Um, it really sort of starts from calling on the collective wisdom of the group that's going to have to make those decisions, I think. The only thing I might add to that is that if it's a change versus something new, um, there, the change management around it might be different. And even in a consensus process, there might be some change management aspects that, uh, or maybe some people or some points in the process that would benefit from um, some change management thought and consideration. And not that something new isn't a change as well, but the, the change management considerations are a little bit different. But that's, um, we're going to move from our Q&A to our key messages piece before we go. And thank you for Karen and also for Leah, one of our colleagues who has been, you know, answering some of the questions in the, in the chat box as well for uh, the question from Doug that came, that came about ground rules and such as well. So thank you for picking up those. Uh, hopefully we covered a lot of the questions that, uh, that I saw here that came in through the chat box. Uh, and, but again, thank you again for, Jen, Amanda, and Karen for answer for those questions, trying to answer those questions from our from our all of our participants. So I think they were, I think they really did dig into some of those areas a little bit more that uh, that were really, really helpful. One more thing before we um, before we uh, let our panelists go here today. We've been very, very lucky to have them, very people that have the uh, you know, Jan, Amanda, and Karen, as you know, they've certainly been a world of experience in this space of building consensus, you know, online and in person. But we do have one more ask of the three of you. And what is a, you know, from the conversations today, from even before you came in, in today, what is a final key message uh, that each of you would like to share with everyone on building consensus online before we leave today? And I'm going to ask each of you to uh, provide a, a thought or two or, or three uh, to that question. And so what is a final key message that each of you would like to share with everyone on building consensus online before we leave? So I'm going to ask Amanda first. You're up first. Let's see, because I had my mic on mic. <laughs> uh, so my, I think, top line message is that uh, when you are in a group, trying to make decisions, especially trying to make decisions on behalf of an organization or a cause that you all care about, your goal is to get the best thinking out of the group. Consensus is not a goal. It's a tool that might be a really, really, really good fit for getting that thinking out of the group. It isn't always the right tool though. And it's not the same as requiring unanimous consent. Uh, it's a process that you use 
to engage in those convergent and divergent decision making packages where you can have a, a discussion that gets you to a general agreement takes a whole bunch of opinions and lands on an action or a solution that people everyone in the room um understands and can live with okay okay i'm totally jumping in and going next because that was basically going to be my final key message as well <laughs> consensus on the consensus she stole um so what i'll do is i'll add to it and say that my final key message would be be thoughtful about where consensus as a process and a tool would be powerful and where it's where it wouldn't be as powerful, where it wouldn't be as impactful. Not everything requires a consensus process. Um, even if it's possible, even if you're free of time constraints, even if it's not a binary where there's a right and a wrong decision, you don't always need to do consensus. So be thoughtful about where you invest that time and effort. Um, yeah, so that consensus can be the most powerful and most meaningful process for the people involved, for your organization, and I think most importantly for your mission as a nonprofit and the people you're serving. Um, I, I really think that 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 mission focus should be should be front and center. Yeah, thoughtful. We use it. Mission focus. So use those key discussions, those key areas. Yeah. Thank you, Jen and Amanda for those key messages. Karen, you get the final word on your key message from the, the, from the panel. I knew, Jen, I knew Jen was gonna jump in because they already had some of the great, great ideas, but actually one of the, the key takeaways that I would say is to really design a, an effective process. I, do, I really do think that's critical to, to success. It helps build that trust and clarity. It helps for more meaningful dialogue and getting the groups to agreement and, and hopefully to action and, and inspire them. So I think, um, and, and it's, it's, there's quite a bit in, to unpack in that as well. So I think, I think if people you know, spend the time and, and dedicate the time needed to really come up with the good questions, make sure everybody's on the same page and communicate and you know, figure out what works for the group and, and we'll get the best results out of it, I think is, is really important. Right, so yeah, the emphasis on design, that's don't ever uh, underestimate how important that is, that there's good design. Thanks for that, that message, Karen. Thank you, um, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Community Development Unit and the participants here today, thank you, Amanda, Jennifer, and Karen, uh, for sharing your perspectives and sharing your experience uh, with building consensus. Uh, as we heard from our panelists, it is <laughs> probably, it is and probably always will be challenging uh, but hopefully from our exploration today, we've now gained some insights and perspectives as, as well as some strategies and tools to better prepare uh, and lead consensus aimed discussions. Uh, again, I can't say enough. I owe you, the three of you, uh, dearly for taking the time to be here today. Our whole unit does. So Amanda, Jen and Karen, thank you so much for your time spent with us today. Really, really appreciate it. And we're also going to uh, have one more participant activity as well. So we would like to hear from all of you, what were some things that you heard or points that were made in this panel session today that stood out and you'll likely remember well when you're tasked with uh, coordinating, facilitating and or leading consensus aimed group discussions. So we're gonna use the chat box for this. And so if, if uh, Love to hear what some of your thoughts are around some of those points uh, you heard that uh, stood out and you're going to remember well after. Uh, I see a few of these here. Toby, certainly you're mentioning a wonderful dynamic webinar. Thank you, panelists, for your information. Yeah, I, definitely, we are all echoing that. The pictures, the shapes, and the animals. Yes, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> um, certainly about preparation is being very, very key. And then the process, preparation and the process that we heard, uh, how important that is. Some of the tools, so there's Jamboard, some of the things that uh, we saw there. Yeah, some of the ideas that are in the chat box. Now let's have you hear from a few others. Uh, Toby wrote many notes, but yes, the drawing of shapes, the gradient of agreement, scoring system. Dr. Sean Haynes talking about the clarity of thought and information, outstanding. Yeah, kudos to kudos panelists for good. Kudos from our, from our participants to you. 
the round table image, leaning forward, passion and emotion and voices, really engaged. We all care. Yeah, some good thoughts, how important that is when we're talking about consensus. Uh, determining what consensus is defined for the group, making sure we do some really good job with that ahead of time. I think a message messaging there that was heard by participants. Love the ideas again, the sharing of the drawing. Um, you know, get building consensus is a journey. We certainly heard that a number of times from all of our participants, or sorry, from all of our panelists. And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Make sure we keep that strongly in our in our mind. And. Yeah, determining you know times when to use and not use the tool. It isn't the be all and end all for everything we do. Certainly, there are times when it works well, but there are times when it's it's not the best uh, process or tool to be used. So some of those thoughts are really, really, really helpful as well. And Toby mentioned about the why. Why do we use it? Making sure we're clear together as a group, as an organization, on you know why are we doing this? Why are we going down this journey, this path? You know, the importance of making sure we have that uh, clearly understood before we venture into the actual building consensus together. Yeah, some great thoughts, uh, everybody. Good work on the. You know, I really, uh, you know, I certainly enjoy. Thank you for your participation and your thoughts in the chat box. That was really, really uh, helpful and nice sharing together some of the things that we gained from our time together in these uh, two hours that we've had. All right, as you're completing your evaluation form, can you know definitely keep doing that. I just thought I would mention our upcoming webinar uh, sessions that are coming up. And uh, you can see it, mostly they're gonna be in the spring now. There's only one left in the winter, that's March 2nd, tomorrow, building a strong team and effective relationships. Um, but the we can see the, the other sessions all the way from legal landscape, board roles, responsibilities, so on and so forth. Um, we would love to have you join us for any of those webinars on those those topic areas coming up. So, and if you are interested or you want to pass the information on to your some your board, your organization, uh, please do. And you can see that we're, that we're in the then we'll be put the registration link in the chat box here real soon. You see it right on the slide right now, but uh, that's where you you just go in there and you'd be able to register for any of the sessions that are there. I'd love to have you join us uh, for any of those sessions that are upcoming. So just wanted to make sure you're well aware of that. Uh, again, I mentioned the nonprofit Bistro series. Again, the same place to register uh, for the session. Um, you can then also, um, you can the dynamic board staff relationship panel session coming up on March 7th. So if you enjoyed the session today, you're, there's gonna be another session where we're gonna talk about that that uh, board staff relationship, uh, the interesting parts of it is kind of a uh, complements our building a strong team effective relationship session. We're just going to dive a little bit more into the dynamic board staff relationship piece. So again, with three three new panelists that'll be uh, that'll be centering our discussion with them on that topic area. So. That is it, folks. Uh, I did want to mention again, if anybody would like to have a question or need further information or like to request our services, or you know, there you can see all the contact information that's also in your toolkit as well. Um, certainly, uh, please do. And you know, again, they're even chatting one on one with you about it, maybe an organization uh, issue or challenge that you'd like to talk about. We'd be more than happy to uh, spend some time with you. You can see the our CDU consult line towards that end. So again, you can get a hold of us also by email and uh, some of the recordings that are on the YouTube channel and a number of other ways that uh, you can get uh, connect with the, with with the offers that we have for all of you. Again, all about making sure. Uh, um, that you the nonprofit organizations have the have the tools to have the knowledge and tools to to make things go well in your organizations. It's all about that towards that end. So without uh, thank you everybody for taking the time uh, to be here. Um, again, this is uh, this is uh, this building consensus. It's hard work, but hopefully in the your, your time you spent here with our panelists. Um, it was it was valuable time, meaningful time, and as you do your work in the community, uh, that, you, that you work out there, that you can certainly this has been helpful towards that end. And I do want to say, and I say this on behalf of our of our community development unit and our, all our panelists as well. Thank you for taking the time to be there, out there with non not for profit boards, whether you're board or staff. 
uh, take as a volunteer, whatever role you might be playing out there, because everything that we have out there in our communities is a result of people like you that take the time to towards that end. So thank you so much for doing that. And that's it, folks, for today. Again, thanks for taking the time to be with us. So take care. Bye for now.